So I'm Jonathan Altman. I'm going to be talking about building a cauldron for chef to cook in, and I'll explain what that means in a second as we get into it. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background of how I how I came about meeting this concept. Um, I spent 12 years. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, by practice. I'm not typically an operations person. Uh, 12 years architecting uh, a fairly large product at leading uh, software as a service provider. Um, as such, I spent a lot of time working directly with the operations people. Um, my role was generally to be the obnoxious person coming in asking to put something else in, on the machines in the data center, or one of the people who did that. Uh, so I've got a, a good bit of experience trying to work with people who have to keep machines up and running with how do we get this new piece of something into our stack? Um, I stopped doing that last summer. I started two companies of my own. Uh, so I'm now uh, independent. I've got uh, my own two businesses. Uh, one is a software as a service and, and product based company. The other is a, uh, basically it's a services firm. I do contracting and consulting work. Um, and one of the important notes about that for the services firm is my customers have access to their source code. I'm doing work for them. Uh, they actually license software to me, but they have rights to it. They need to be able to get into the server. So one of the things that that, that means and that, that that came up with was I need to provide a way for them to be able to get at uh, things that they've licensed from me. Um, the other thing that it means, because I'm a, a, a single person with two businesses, uh, but it even meant um, at the at my previous employment, which started out as a very small startup, uh, I don't have a lot of time to waste. Um, automation is good. Um, you know, I I can't afford to sit down and have you know 20 minutes of typing different commands to do. If I can push a button or hit one command line and have things. Uh, get done for me, that's a very good thing. So anything I can automate, I will. So what's a cauldron? Um, and it is, you, you can read the bullets as well as I can, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight the, the first part of it. It's a complete as you want build and deployment system. Um, and it can be more than one machine. Uh, for my purposes, I can fit them all on, on one actual machine. Uh, but the idea is what I want is I want my source code artifacts, I want um, my deployment system with access to those source code repositories on a box. Uh, eventually, I want to be able, when I check in source code artifacts, if there are builds that need to be run and automated tests that should be run, it should be run. Uh, some other things to look at in the future is ticketing system. Uh, ticketing systems generally will integrate with uh, especially various of the Git servers particularly well. Um, you know, you can set up Jira, for example, that if you turn in a, a specially formulated commit message, it knows, oh, okay, you're you, you're actually, you know, you you've closed this ticket. Um, this Git commit means that this ticket's now closed. Things can move. Um, you can add group chat servers, um, and and we'll talk about those things. And one of the last ones is. Um, you're going to want to have a real cert on that, a uh, real SSL certificate, um, kind of a nifty minor point, but it's something you should do. Um, the task is awesome. It is. Um, you, know, you should use Hosted Chef. Um, you, should, uh, you, know, you, should, you should use all these things. This is not exclusive. Um, and, and we'll go over that. So, so here are a list of vendors that you could go. You could go pull all of this together. Um, one thing is if you do that, you've got webhooks, uh, hosts, and, and, and web service calls going around all over the place to get this done. Nothing wrong with that. You've also got a bunch of vendors you need to deal with. Um, but it is one way to do it, and, and coming out of software services, it's, one, it's wonderful, and, and it's a perfectly reasonable way to go about things. But I'm going to bring up the, the three R's, which are not the ones we learned in school. They're redundancy, resiliency, and, and revelation. I, I apologize, kind of reaching for that last one. <laughs> um, so redundancy, um, pretty clear. You, you never have one copy of anything, right? I mean, you, you write papers in college. I had several friends who've gotten PhDs. They had like five copies of their dissertation as they were working on it. You know, they have, uh, you know, my age, they have one floppy disk, but they have like three floppy disks, and they, you know, 
have a spare hard disk that they would, you know, go put in somebody else's room and, you know, they really, you know, made sure that they had things. It's one good reason to do this. There's no reason that that you can't use GitHub and your own Git server, for example. Um, it's, it's actually the model I work in, and, and I'll cover that a little bit. Um, and it comes with redundancy, disaster recovery. Uh, if, if you know, if, if you are using your own server and it goes down, do you have a backup somewhere? It's a good place to have somebody like GitHub, who's a, a lot less likely than you, let's say, to lose your data. Um, for at least Git Chef and continu most continuous integration, you can actually have multiple sources. Um, you can actually have multiple servers. Um, hosted Chef that may be a little bit more difficult. Uh, that's not really a model that I've looked into, but there's no reason you can't have two Chef servers up. Um, and the night plugin we're going to talk about uh, for handling building up your own uh, Chef server has the backup and restore capability built in. So um, resiliency. Uh, this first point, there's a trade-off between your ability to deliver uptime and your software as a service provider's motivation to address issues that affect your uptime. And so I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that. It's, it's kind of a philosophical issue, and it's similar to the open source versus proprietary and what happens when things go wrong. Uh, you know, the answer to open source is, well, you have the source, just fix it, right? Um, you know, the alternative is we have proprietary vendors, and you have a contract. You, know, you have a service contract that says, well, we'll go fix it. Well, okay, uh, that's great in in a CYA mode. You know, okay, you're you're protected. You know, you can go say, well, we found a bug. The bug's in the software. We we submitted it to the vendor. They'll fix it. And now you're off the hook. That's great. I'm still off the hook. I'm down, but I'm off the hook. Um, is that really helpful at some point? You know, maybe at some point having control over your own resources becomes a good thing. I know that it may be down, but I can throw money and resources at this problem. I mean, if I really had to, I could go find the maintainers of the source and say, I'm going to put a real, actual, substantial bounty behind this. Not I, I someone recent is like, I'll pay you $87 to add this feature to semantic versioning for Node. That's not really anything. But I could actually say, I'm going to cut whoever fixes this bug on the committer team a five-figure check. And if it's multiple of you, I'll cut all of you a five-figure check. You could do that. Um, so it's it's not necessarily, not necessarily an issue that comes up, but you have to, it is one way that I think about that issue. Um, what are what are my motivations and my desire to get something fixed and back up versus potentially a vendor who even I've signed a contract with them, it may not be their biggest customer, it may not be their only problem, it may not be their highest priority problem. Um, there's another trade-off. Uh, if you think about being on GitHub, there's you know, think about there may be lots of interesting repositories there. It's a nifty honeypot. If I'm gonna try and go get some valuable source code. One of the best places I might do that if I were a, a, a black hat was I'm going to go after, I'm going to see if I can break into whoever it is. And I don't mean to lie them. I'm, I'm sure they're perfectly secure. And honestly, they're going to be way more secure than anything I'm going to put together. Um, make no mistake about this. I am not asserting that I can do a better job of posting a Git repository than GitHub does. They're way better. They're also a way bigger target. Um, so, you know, use a hosted service. You are, you may be collateral damage in, in some other much higher value targets take, but you've still been compromised. Um, you run your own, you're much less of a target. On the other hand, you're probably much less protected. If anybody cares about you, that might be a problem. Um, and then the other one is, you retain the ability when you run your own resources. You can put as many and as large boxes as you want behind it. Uh, you don't, you know, you have something that takes a long time. You have a ginormous repository. You have a very complex, very huge chef thing. You have, uh, you don't want to wait for your hosted Jenkins to run. Great, run your own. Make it as big as you want. Make it as many as you want. Um, you can do that. Um, 
And then the last one's Revelation. Um, I mentioned it a little bit in terms of being able to fix your own problems, but you have the tools and the ability to help yourself. Um, you, you will actually understand all of it. The problem is you have to put the time in to learn all of that. Uh, but one, one example of Git itself is, is not GitHub. I mean, GitHub has some things on top of it, but sometimes you actually have to go look at here's what Git does. Um, and, and doing this yourself will we'll bring you back to that. Okay, so what is a cauldron? Um, there are basically two parts of it. One is you have your workstation, which is where you have some configuration information. Um, so you have a client workstation where um, ideally I would recommend you have the Chef Omnibus client installer on there and the knife server plugin installed. Uh, you want to get client software installed on that machine as well. Um, most modern Linux machines, that's not a particular problem. Uh, Windows and uh, Mac OS 10, you're probably going to go get that stuff on there. Um, so I'm going to go over quickly. I'm not going to go over all the steps. I'll put these slides up, but you know, walk through roughly what it is. First, you want to do is set up your Cauldron workstation. Uh, and I'm actually going to show how to create a vagrant box to do that. Um, I did that for the purposes of these exercises, mostly because my, my workstation already has my main setup on it, and I wanted an isolated station, uh, station to do it. But I'm also increasingly convinced it is the right way to do it. I think I would do it that way in the future versus having uh, my, my everyday machine's um, host operating system doing it. Um, so, uh, just walking through the basic uh, setups of a Vagrant machine, bootstrap your Vagrant, install Chef Omnibus. Uh, and as an example, all the slides you're seeing today, uh, other than actually provisioning the machine I'm going to use as my cauldron at a, at a remote uh, infrastructure provider, all this stuff I did this afternoon, uh, basically from about 3 o'clock until I came over here. So um, it's fairly quick to do. Now, granted, I'm just repeating steps I've already done. There's a learning process. But the, the, the actual process, but once you've done it once, doesn't take all that long. Uh, so at this point, I've, I've bootstrapped up the Vagrant, and it's got Chef Clients on it. You're going to want to put the Knife Server plugin in. We'll talk a little bit about what Knife Server does. Knife Server, plugin to create Chef Servers on the command line, running primarily on Ubuntu. It may support some other ones. Uh, I haven't looked in, into any great depth on it. Um, I, I would say Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, um, RHEL, Fedora, you're probably safe. I'm not sure I get much farther uh, away from trying to do things than that. Um, it can create those servers against. Uh, it can actually spool up an EC2 instance to do it. It can spool up a Linode instance to do it. Or it can do it on a, a standalone Linux OS that's already running, um, which is typically the model that, that I use, but, but any of these will work. They mostly have different command line parameters because, again, on EC2 and Linode, it's actually going to allocate the box for you. Standalone assumes you already have the box up. Um, standalone can also be used if you actually want to have a vagrant server for this call and stuff. You don't want to have a remote one. You want to run it on, on a server that you have or on your own workstation. You can actually create a Vagrant instance to do that. Installing it, um, again, pretty simple. Command line, um, didn't do anything particularly crazy. One thing I'll warn you, you should probably sudo or be root when you do that. Um, I tried to do it without that earlier today, uh, and it's not very happy. All right, so now we have our, our client workstation set up. We have Vagrant box. We've got Chef on this client installer on it. We've got our nice server. So now we're, we're going to make, make our server. I'm going to show, again, as I said, the standalone flavor. Um, the only real difference in all of this is going to be the actual command line invocations and a few steps of some things that you need in your uh, .chef uh, knife.rb file. Um, it's a little bit hard because there's some other stuff you need to get right. Um, you need to have, at least temporarily while you get this bootstrap done, a uh, root account on your server or a machine that has basically sudo, you know, root access level without needing to su or sudo into things. Um, 
with uh, SSH set up with authorized keys so that you can just log in without being prompted for a password. Um, I made this mistake. There's a nifty um, ticket open for it. You need both the public and private parts of your SSH key on the workstation. Um, I only had the private one on there. You get this nifty little error. You put, you put your public part on it as well, then you're happy. So we're going to bootstrap it. Uh, this is basically the whole command. You want to give it a node name. Um, the host, I'm showing a dotted IP address because I haven't put my host in the domain name system. Uh, this machine you're actually seeing, um, oops, I didn't get rid of my IP address. That's actually going to be my new cauldron box. Part of, part of the process of this was uh, I'm actually moving to a bigger server that I'll actually be able to put JIRA onto because I need it. Um, uh, and also Jenkins, so this this will become a live box for me. Um, I've dummied up the command, I've left some other stuff in there. Um, but it you know, basically starts off, I sniffed a whole bunch of stuff, we strapping chef server, <clears throat> complete, we're done. This is, depending on the speed of your server, um, 10 to 20 minute process. Um, I've, I've set up about three or four of these boxes now. Uh, a couple of times what I've done is basically fire that command off and, and go get lunch. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I probably should have thrown it in there, the XKCD comic about, you know, the, the only reason, reasonable excuse for slacking off is my code is compiling. Um, and I've decided that, that uh, chef runs are, are sort of the new, uh, you know, edit, compile, debug cycle. Um, on the other hand, you're getting a lot out of it. And when you're done, you've got a server up, mostly. It's not trusted. Um, so I said, proceed anyway. Um, I actually went to the version, and you see, boy, I've got Chef Server 11.0.8 running in that picture. Um, at that point, you should have Chef Server up and running. Um, I'm going to cheat, and I will admit to having some problems on the latest install. It did break this afternoon. This is actually my old server. Um, I'll own up to it. It's version 10.18.2. Um, something went a little bit sideways in what I was doing. Um, I'll actually go back and say I use standalone. Caused a little problems. You're probably safer using EC2. I'm guessing it's probably the nice server EC2 is, is I'm guessing, the most reliable. Um, and most tested path for, for using that server. Um, but I'm, I, I don't have any background for that. I just know that, that this seems to be a little bit finicky. Uh, it's also the first time in about four or five months I've had to set one of these up. Um, but it does come up. So the next step, we've got our chef server. We need to get our Git server up. You've got a bunch of choices. You go like GitLab, GitLab, GitWeb. Um, you run Windows or OS 10, you pay for hosted GitHub, I'm assuming as well. Um, I'm not going to cover that. Uh, I'm going to talk about using Gitalite um, and go over some of the reasons. Um, GitLab is actually really cool. Um, I forget, the, there's a competitor to GitHub whose name I don't recall. GitHub. Huh? They are a competitor, but they actually started out as Mercurial hosting and put a Git layer over it. Um, GitLab? Hmm? GitLab? Open source. Uh, well, that, that's what we're talking about. But there's actually a hosting provider. They were in the Czech Republic um, who did a bunch of stuff. So, so GitLab is, is your own. You can install this. It's open source and put it on there. Um, every time I look at the instructions, I cringe. It's, um, you know, it's like this long a list of instructions and, and prerequisites and tons of typing in individual commands just didn't, it's probably really cool. Yep. There is a GitLab community code book, though I don't know if it would install the latest version or not. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I've just gone to their site and found the installation instructions, and every time I'm like, this is really cool, I don't actually think I, I, I want to bite off all the stuff that they have. Um, GitLit seems to solve, be solving the same things as GitLab. Um, there's actually some neat things and some downside things to it uh, being built in Java. Um, one of the cool things about it is it's really easy to install. It's basically a war file. Drop it on your machine and, and fire it off, and 
you're running. Um, I have not looked at how they're actually doing their, their Git implementation. Um, they, they basically, from what I understand, have done it all in Java. So I would be a little concerned that I'm just not using the official Git binaries. I'd be worried about you know weird, obscure bugs causing incompatibility. So I might not be able to pick up a Git repo and move it between the, the two machines. Um, if you ever look at it and run across it, um, Gitosis is, or at least was last time I looked at it, a dead, uh, dead project. Um, I used it for a long time. Gitalik came on, came along, and, and kind of replaced it. Um, and it, it basically does what Gitosis did. Does it just as well? It's just as easy to use. No reason not to use it. Um, GitWeb's an HTTP interface, um, CGI interface, just don't. Um, so we're going to install GitAlight. So the first thing you need to do is um, on the Cauldron server, which you haven't done yet, you're going to want to take the, the public part of an SSH key of the user that you're going to do the administration of, the, of your Git, GitAlight server as onto that Cauldron server. Uh, and the reason for that, you do all the administration of GitAlight through a GitHub repo, or through a Git repo. Um, basically, uh, GitAlight, after you set the server up, you do a Git clone of a special repo that it, it automatically creates pulls down its configuration. You make changes, you do them on a client workstation, you commit those changes, you push them to the server. The server has a uh, basically a commit hook that when you send up the changes to that repository, looks at the changes, updates its configuration to represent any new repositories, users, permissions, anything that you've sent up. So the first thing you have to do is put up a public key of the first user of your GitLite system. The one that you're going to use to manage that that GitLite administration repository, and you're wanting you're going to want to rename the idrsa.pub that you're putting up there to whatever you want the username to be for the permission system in GitLite. So, um, as an example, I take my idrsa.pub and I call it Jonathan.pub because I want to be Jonathan in the system, uh, but I could be anything I wanted to be. Um, these really are all the instructions to get GitLight up and running. Clone a repo, run their install script, give it a setup, and pass it the public key of whatever whatever you name this over here. Use it over there, and it says, "I'm going to set it up, and, and the initial admin user is is going to be this name, and there's their key." Uh, quick and easy. It really is about a five-minute process. Um, so now I've got my GitLight server up and running. I need to go actually do some configuration to it. Back on your configuration workstation, you can use the same thing that same vagrant box. Let's say that uses your workstation to set up the Chef server to begin with. Clone the GitLight add GitLight dash admin from whatever Git app, whatever the name of your Cauldron box is. That pulls down that main admin repository. Add any Git repository setups you have, any users you want. Um, and the documentation of GitLite is very good in terms of describing uh, permission lists, roles, things like that for how to do that. Uh, I'm going to set up a very simple one that I have a repository called HeatNode. Um, and I want Jonathan to be basically the admin for that. Um, I can actually do the initial push. This little plus is important for people who are going to create the repository for the first time. You need that plus on the end of that. Um, and then I've got read and write access to it. That's it. You've got a call. You now have your own hosted shell and, and a Git server. You, you are ready to go to town. Um, so I'm going to cover a little bit. Um, I mentioned that you can use Git and multiple, probably non ops code chef, hosted chef versions, um, simply and easily. You can add as many, in, in any particular Git repository you have, you can add as many remotes as you want. The only difference is they all need to have their own unique name. 
Um, by default, when you do a git clone, it calls something. It calls that one origin. Um, every so, anytime you see like you know git push origin master and all that, origin is just a convention. It's just a name. You can actually go in and edit dot git slash config and change that result for command line. You can use to do that. You can call them anything you want. So, for example, I might call that cauldron, which is what I typically do. Um, Give it whatever name you want. You can give it, if you're doing this on a project base, you can give it the name of your customer. Whatever you want to do, totally arbitrary. Add both of them. When you're done, I want to make a backup. Git push origin master. Git push GitHub master. Git push cauldron master. As many of them as you need. Um, however you want to do it. And now you've got some redundancy. Um, so that's it. Um, Last thing, um, you want to put a real cert on the box, a little red warning. Um, in general, if you leave warnings out there and users look at them repeatedly, they tend not to notice that they're, they tend to ignore any warnings, including ones that you might really care about. Uh, so get rid of it. Um, as of on the Chef 11, they're using Nginx for the HTTP server. It's actually fairly easy to drop a cert on there once you have it. Go get your own trusted one. Um, if you really insist on it, make yourself your own certifying authority and update your browsers to recognize your own CA, but that seems like a bit of overkill. That's it. Questions? Yeah, yeah, so, so like are you using data for your backend or are you using dedicated servers or using Linode or like EC2 or where? Uh, like Linode or EC2. Um, I'm actually using, um, uh, I'm actually right now using three different providers for three different cauldrons. Um, Are you using dedicated servers or like DPSs? Um, they're basically, the, uh, one of them, they're probably all KVM instances. Oh, okay. Um, so one's a joint, it's an Ubuntu. Uh, box at uh, Joyant, so I know for a fact that's a KVM instance. Mm -hmm. uh, another one I think is a chunk host, and the one I was configuring here was actually a digital ocean. So um, you, you, you take your choice. And again, if you're using you know, EC2 or Linode, it's, you know, you're using your environment. But I, you know, I, I don't see, clearly you have to trade off what your security risks what security risks you think you have by using VPS or um, you know whatever the mechanism is and whatever host you're using versus you're going to have your own iron. On the other hand, I don't think that's actually your biggest security problem if you're going to host this all yourself. Yeah. So so you just have like an Ubuntu like virtual instance on. Yep. On German, German. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, and that's, um, you know, I'd love to use their nifty um, open Solaris, you know, Illumos based stuff, but um, again, I, I don't really feel like getting off the beaten path is way too easy to spool up in Ubuntu 1204 long term support server and just not have to swim against the tide. Yeah. 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 Yeah.